war in Ukraine, the 6th of February. Ukrainian strikes on the Russian economy. What happens to Ukraine after the war? Let's start with Ukrainian strikes. As we have all seen, Ukraine has started what looks like a sustained campaign against Russian infrastructure and especially against the Achilles heel of Russia, its oil exports. And that is much more important than any ship sunk or plane shot down. Take away enough of Russian energy exports and the economy will start tanking in a big way. And then social unrest becomes much more likely and they have much less money for the Russian army. Only recently we have seen attacks at the Volgograd refinery capable of producing some 300,000 barrels per day. The Ryazan oil refinery has been hit and the fuel export terminal at Ustluga was also struck, possibly cutting exports by 120,000 barrels per day. The largest Russian refinery at Nizhny Novgorod needs one to two months of repairs after an alleged Ukrainian drone strike, and on it goes. We know that Russia has voluntarily cut oil production by first 300,000 barrels and then 500,000 barrels during 2023. Those cuts might have been all voluntary or might have been forced upon Russia from production problems, which is not improbable. If we remember that Western technology and know-how left Russia after 2022, production problems are not unlikely as a cause for at least a part of those production cuts. So what Ukraine is doing now by hitting Russian oil exports has two consequences. First, it will disrupt oil export to some degree. We can expect that Russia has at least some spare capacity, but that will likely diminish as Ukrainian continues hitting more facilities. The second point is the need to repair the damaged facilities. This will require spare parts, likely western spare parts, or some alternative that will be more expensive. We know that it will be more expensive because if cheaper ways to produce and maintain the Russian oil infrastructure had been available before 2022, they would have used those instead of Western technologies. And as they did not, whatever Russia is now using to keep their infrastructure up and running will be more expensive. Russia is a huge country, as Russian state media and pro-Russian bloggers keeps reminding us. What they do not say is that the very foundation for Putin's power, the energy sector, is also a huge area to defend. And Ukraine only needs one to two drones to get through, and that can shut down production of 100,000 barrels for one to two months or even more. The only way Russia can respond is either to hit all Ukrainian drone launch sites, which is impossible, or try to move additional air defense units to protect their infrastructure, which also is impossible to do for all infrastructure. It is impossible because Russia is such a huge country. Russia showed Ukraine what you can do with cheap long-range drones and Ukraine seems to have learned that lesson very well. Bang for the buck, a drone costing maybe $20,000 or three 155mm artillery shells can remove 120,000 barrels per day for one to two months. If we assume a price of $60 per barrel, if we assume all is profit, which of course it is not, as you also have production and transportation costs, but it would make a loss of $200 million for 30 days, plus the cost of repairing the facility. That equation is one Ukraine will always win and Russia will always lose. As long as Ukraine has the drones and the ability to get them on target, 
we can expect that Russian spare capacity of oil production and export will continue to decrease until a point where they might not have any spare capacity available. At that time, the disruption will become much more noticeable and that will directly show on the Russian revenues. Russia is playing for time, but I do not think they have time to play with. This is a strategic win for Ukraine, as Russia cannot respond. Russia can attack and hit cities, take out electricity for a while, and make life very hard for Ukrainian civilians. But they do not have any strategic targets they can take out that would affect Ukraine in the same way as Ukraine can affect Russia. For the simple fact that the bulk of what keeps Ukraine in this war comes from outside the country. This is why Russia is so keen to take aid away from Ukraine and from some countries they are successful in doing so. So keep an eye on these Ukrainian strikes as they are hitting the very core of the Russian logistical chain. And if they keep this up it will have ripple effects all the way to the Russian soldiers now fighting inside Ukraine. So let's talk a little bit what happens after the war. What we have to consider and what relatively few are considering is what is the Ukrainian goal after this war. Mostly we talk about liberating all territory, joining NATO and the EU and that is it. Now, militarily, Ukraine can, in my opinion, liberate all of Ukraine. It will not be cheap and it will not happen in the coming two years, but it can be done, as long as Ukraine gets enough external aid. As always, it boils down to logistics, and that means funds, in other words, money. Money does not guarantee a victory in any time period you choose, but no money will guarantee a defeat, as no money means no funding, so no logistics. Now, as always, this is not black and white. There is never no funding or all funding. It will always be a grayscale between those two positions. And for Ukraine, those positions are based on external support and internal funding. So not all boils down to Western support even though most of it does. But if we zoom out and look at this war, it is actually made up of two parts. We have a civil war backed by Russia and a conventional invasion by Russia. And they are two very different things, especially if we look into the future. I think Ukraine can win both these parts of the war. A military victory for Ukraine over Russia is a definite possibility, if they have the tools. Even to liberate Crimea is feasible over time. Take out the Karsh bridge, get fire support over the shipping lanes and air superiority, and Crimea can simply not hold out. The much more difficult task is the civil war part of this war. Usually the assumption is that Ukraine liberates all occupied parts of Ukraine and the civilians will greet them as liberators. That is probably true in Kherson and Saporizhia Oblast, but by no means certain in Luhansk and Donetsk Oblasts or Crimea. What Russia has done is really ethnic cleansing. All people, all Ukrainians openly supporting the democratically elected president have either fled, been pushed out or are being arrested as we speak. So when Ukraine has militarily won this war, there are several possibilities and some of them are less than desirable. If the general population of Luhansk and Donetsk is in favor of Russia, and if that is true, we cannot know now. But that is by no means impossible. What happens then? One scenario is an ongoing civil war in those parts funded by Russia that will see a more or less intensive civil war continue for maybe decades. What can Ukraine do to win such a battle? 
That is not easy. And the Israel-Palestine conflict or the endless wars in Africa and South America tells us as much. Ukraine cannot do their own ethnic cleansing as it would then lose all support they now have and then be ripe for another Russian invasion. They cannot conduct an ongoing civil war against the population as that will always turn ever more brutal and so Ukraine would again lose their external support. Such a civil war militarily is really impossible to win. You only have to look at the Vietnam War or the wars in Afghanistan to realize this. Germany after World War II is the opposite, where we really had all the components for a guerrilla war that never happened. So the worst scenario is by no means certain. And there is much we can learn from the end of that conflict. Take all the lessons after World War II and none of the actions done after World War I and you have a good start. For Ukraine to win this war, they have to show that living inside Ukraine is better or preferable to living inside Russia, or at least acceptable. And to do that, they have to degrade the Russian economy as much as possible, while offering the population in those two oblasts any reason to choose Ukraine over Russia. Now one can question why I bring this up now when a military victory over Russia is unlikely to happen within two years and it will probably drag on for longer than that. The reason is that this will be the hardest battle for Ukraine to win and how to win over the population should already now be on the table. Economical incentives are a powerful thing. Some sort of possible autonomy inside Ukraine is also a possibility. Winning over key figures in those oblasts now can reap big benefits for the future and might even shorten the war if possible. We often forget to mention that the soldiers killed from Donetsk and Luhansk fighting for Russia also have families likely wanting this war to just end and whoever is the winner matters less to them. Now I am not sure there is any wiggle room among the general population or the leadership in Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts. Likely not in the leadership as they are dictators in being but in the population there might be. My aim is for Ukraine to be able to liberate all occupied territories and have security and peace after that. So we do not sit here talking about another major war or civil war in the coming decades. In general, I don't want anyone to get killed as that should really not be needed in 2024. But as there is a war and people will get killed, I want to see as few Ukrainians killed as possible. That is the only way for Ukraine to be a free country that does not have mandatory torture cells, rapes or general killings of civilians, which are the hallmarks of the Russian army and the Russian occupying forces. It is also the only way for people to be able to say what they want without being arrested on some trumped up charges. But it also means that all people in those oblasts, when Ukraine has won, must be able to vote. And what will be the dynamic of that? And to reach a Ukrainian victory and so peace, we have to think about how that can be achieved after a purely military victory is reached. And that will require getting the people now under Russian rule, now identifying as Russians, or at least having their leanings towards Russia to switch side or at the very least accept they are Ukrainians. I do not know what the population in Donetsk or Luhansk really think. They might very much look forward to getting out from under a dictatorship. I know I would. And if that is the case, there is really no problem. But if they are not, that needs to be handled and how to do that needs to be talked about now and not in the future.
History has many lessons of what not to do and some lessons of what to do. But none of them have an equation, do this and this will follow. It is always more or less probable, but there are no certainties. But I pose this question to you. If Ukraine turned the population in Luhansk and Donetsk away from Russia, what would the Russian army situation be? A hundred thousand fewer soldiers, supply lines going through enemy territory, and every military convoy needed to be guarded, as a few examples. The current Russian army could not operate under such conditions. Now is that possible? Likely not. But the benefits would be so great for Ukraine that it must be worth the effort. And uh, taking steps towards what happens after all oblasts are liberated already now might see that scale just move a bit in favor of Ukraine. And that could have far-reaching benefits for Ukraine in this war. US military request of Sweden Sweden has got a request from the US to provide military aid to the Red Sea. And had this request come up one year ago, I would have supported that 100% without a second thought. But this is not one year ago and the situation is changing. I think that Sweden should provide whatever aid it can, because securing those sea lanes affects the world economy, and so of course will affect Sweden and Europe in that key area of energy. If oil prices go up, production costs also goes up and the world economy goes down. The more important reason is that while Sweden is not yet part of NATO, we will get there. And if an alliance member who is committed to NATO asks Sweden, Sweden should, if possible, help out. And here we are not talking about Article 5, which is a totally other matter. And remember, Sweden is still not covered by that article. When Sweden is in NATO, Article 5 must be the holy grail, as it is the very core to what is NATO. But what is between that article and other requests, we have a sliding scale. The yes today is not at all certain in the future, especially if US and European securities start diverging, which we already can see tendencies of. It is not certain they will, but it is not certain they will not. Personally, I think for world security, the more cooperation we have, the more security we will also get. But we have to work in the reality we are living in and not the reality we wish for. And if we are seeing a shift now, we have to think about how to handle that in the future. Europe needs to get out from under the energy threat and how that dictates security. Because whether we like it or not, the bulk of that energy is in the hands of some very unsavory people. So for Europe, switching towards cleaner and renewable energy is a must from a security point of view. Now you can put nuclear power there, but uranium is not mined in Europe and the biggest producer is Kazakhstan. So we would only replace one energy form for another, but still have the same security problems we have today. So as I see it, Renewable is really the only way to go if we want to have some energy security, with the major benefit of it helping the climate. And we already have the possibility to increase that significantly with current technology. As always, battery power is the major stumbling block. The sun does not shine at night, or not all days for that matter. And the wind might blow too much when it's not needed and not enough when it is needed. The Achilles heel of renewable energy. My suggestion is simple and far cheaper than building new nuclear power plants and bringing the same energy security that Europe needs. 
simply build repumping stations for the hydroelectric power stations we already have in use. In Sweden we produce around 65 terawatt hours per year with around 50% spare capacity if seen over the whole year. So if we have the energy and renewables can provide that, we can use the dams to almost directly add another 65 terawatts with relatively minimal environmental impact and relatively low costs. Building up the infrastructure will of course have some impact, but as compared to most other energy forms, likely significantly less. But there is work to be done there also. When Europe can reduce its dependencies, energy security increases and the industry will be less affected by oil prices. So the European economy will have a much higher growth capacity. It is simply a win-win situation. It also brings another added benefit. In a fractioned world, Europe can start separating security from energy. Other areas will become more important, like minerals, but we have to take one step at a time. So right now, I am in favor of Sweden sending what aid it can to the Red Sea, which would likely be naval assets. Answering similar requests in the future will likely become harder. While US and Sweden might have the same goal today, that might very well not be the case tomorrow. I hope it will, but it is by no means certain. And what is happening now will have a profound effect that will last decades. What we can say with some certainty is that the status quo we had with no war in Europe will not remain. It will change, either for the better or for the worse. And if we, meaning Europe, gets less dependent on oil, the requests might not even come up, not for Europe anyway. Why are Houthis hitting oil ships? Because of its impact on the world economy. The less the impact, the less chance any oil tankers are attacked. Logistics wins the war, and in the war for world security, one has to secure the logistical chain. And that might mean finding alternative sources of that key commodity, energy. I hope this video was watchable. If you liked it, give a thumbs up and subscribe. And I hope to see you at my next video.